now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for April 3rd, 2024. In accordance with board policy 8311, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Stolowski? Present. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Ms. Myers? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistead? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. We also have Ms. Sanowski? Present. Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. Wicks? Present. Ms. Blotner? Present. Ms. Dingle? Present. Dr. DeGans? Present. Dr. Finger Elam? Present. And Mr. Billingsley? And Dr. Biancoli? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak in turn. Committee members will also acknowledge they have a question by calling on the chair, then stating their name. Staff members will also answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee members will move and say their name and second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote, please. Assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately for the ETA. So welcome back everybody. I hope you had a wonderful spring break. We have a um, overpacked meeting and we have a hard stop at 5.30 because many people on the call um, are heading to um, Dr. Rogers' um, presentation this evening. So because of that, and because for some reason, the narration on two of the PowerPoints did not come through, we're going to um, move two of the agenda items to the next meeting, the early learning assessment and the iCivics, because I know that the ELA and the um, ELL English language development presentation may take longer, and I don't wanna have to cut those off. So um, two of the pieces will be moved, um, except one question, Dr. DiDonato, um, I know the early learning assessment is information, not contractual. Does the iCivics have a um, deadline that we're going to compromise if we move that one? No, it's not a contract. It's uh, to provide some information about a pilot that we're exploring. So okay. no, no contract okay. associated. Okay, so the two without contracts associated will be moved to the main meeting. So okay, we're going to start you. with, I'm sorry, go ahead. I just said thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So we're going to start with the interpreting services. Um, so we'll discuss and answer any questions. This one did have a narration, um, and Ms. Myers is ready to answer any questions that we may have. So Ms. Myers. Yes. Hi, everyone. So this contract is actually an extension for a short period of time while it's going out for rebidding. Um, this is interpreting services for um, deaf and hard of hearing individuals for both students and staff members. We are required to um, provide interpreters um, and this contract allows us to be able to do that. Um, I can talk further about it if unless there's just questions or not. Um, I think the PowerPoint was pretty self-explanatory. So what questions do any um, board members have at this time? Okay, I'm not hearing any um, questions. So do I have a motion to, um, to approve the interpreting services contract? So move, Stolowski. So 
Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Booker DeWire. Thank you. Ms. Cox, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Um, Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker DeWire? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That was approved for curriculum committee. And the next item on the agenda is the contract for board certified behavior analysis. And again, we have Ms. Myers um, to give us an overview and answer any questions. Perfect. Okay. Hi, me again. Uh, so this is uh, for board certified behavior analysts, um, or otherwise known as BCBAs, um, to provide both consultative and direct services. Um, so this is a contract. We have had something similar. Um, this is coming back to the board um, after doing a um, a bid for providers. Um, these folks provide. Um, I guess you heard the PowerPoint, but these folks provide um, both direct service and consultative to for both staff and classrooms as well as students um, with significant um, behavior and learning needs. Uh, a large portion of the work that this contract does is around a non-public preventative partnership that is actually at the White Oak School. So it ends up being a cost savings for the system with um, being able to avoid non-public placements. So I can talk about this further as well if there are questions or being efficient oh. with time. Okay, questions about this contract? Okay, hearing none, um, may I have a motion to approve um, the contract for board certified behavior analysts? Analysts, analysts, sorry. So moves to Lusky. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Dominowski. Thank you. Ms. Cox, may we have a roll call vote, please? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolowski? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. That is also approved to move forward to the contract committee. Next on the agenda is music instruments and supplies. Um, and for that, we have Ms. Shea and Ms. I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Skinkowski. Skinkowski. I knew that. Correct. Okay. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for having us. I'm, again, in the interest of time, I think this is pretty self-explanatory. We use this contrast to purchase musical instruments. Uh, we have quite a robust inventory of musical instruments that we use for our exploratory program at the elementary level, but also as part of our loan program um, for middle and high school students. We also use this contract as we are opening, for example, Nottingham Middle School. We use this um, contract to purchase instruments for their inventory as well. Uh, Ms. Sinkowski, anything that you want to add in particular, but then we'll just open for questions again in the interest of time. Absolutely, Megan, I think you captured it well. Um, it does replace um, a, a contract that is due to expire at the end of May. So um, this will provide um, a, a five year term on a new contract to support um, all of our music programs, essentially pre-K through 12. OK, hey, thank you. Questions from board members? OK, hearing none. Um, may I have a motion to approve the music instruments and supplies contract? So moves to Lusky. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pump. Second. Okay, we got seconds and third. So, Ms. Cox, can we have a roll call vote, please? <laughs> um, Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dalmanowski? Yes. Ms. Dolosky? Yes. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. That Thank also you. is approved to move forward to the Contracts Committee. Okay, slowing down now. Our next topic is the textbooks and anthologies for English courses, grades 6 through 12. And we are going to actually, um, if it's okay, well, actually, um, Ms. Craft is here, right? Yes, yeah. Dr. Kraft okay. and Ms. Wicks are both here. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, we were maybe having to make a time adjustment, but since they are both here, we'll continue. Um, before we get started both with this contract um, 
as well as the next one. Um, I wanted to share one of the things that we're looking to do next school year is um, a shift with how we pilot curriculum within BCPS. So what you're going to hear on both of these presentations is a request for a contract for a full year pilot that will be district wide. Our goal is to pilot curriculum so that we truly know the impact on students in varieties of groups across grade levels and we have quantifiable data to really measure um, outcomes with the implementation of a pilot. So part of this would be the professional development learning that we will be providing to teachers um, prior to next school year as well as over the summer and then the implementation of a year-long pilot next school year. Um, this is a shift from some practices that have been you know most recently done and um, with regards to looking at curriculum but with our goal of also aligning with MSD's um, identification of high quality instructional materials we want to ensure that we're being fiscally responsible and aligning our timeline for a purchase with their identification of those products um, so that we're both looking at the quality of how materials work with our students, um, but also aligning with what um, the State Department may identify as high quality instructional materials. Um, so just as a precursor um, for both of these two upcoming discussions. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Shea, Dr. Kraft, and Ms. Fix. Ms. Shea, did you want to say anything before Ms. Lips nope, starts? I'm, I'm going to turn it right over to the experts to jump right in because I'm sure that the uh, board members will have questions and I want to make sure there's time okay. for the discussion. So go ahead. Perfect. All right, Ms. Wicks. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Kraft and I will be tag teaming this presentation so we can begin with the next slide. Our goal in the Office of Secondary English Language Arts in alignment with MSDE is to provide access to a rigorous and meaningful education that prepares students for whatever future pathway they choose. Um, we firmly believe that all students, as you can see on the screen, regardless of income, race, ethnicity, and or ability should have equitable access to new curricula and college and career pathways. And that's our focus this evening. Next slide. In English for grades 6 through 12, we are currently in the process of identifying new curricula to support those goals for the upcoming school year and beyond. Per BCPS policy in Rule 6002, as we evaluate and select instructional materials, there are a number of criteria that must be considered in the selection. A few that you can see listed on the screen are that materials must be representative of the pluralistic nature and diversity of a global society, and representative of different viewpoints and perspectives on controversial topics. Our focus in ELA is always to prevent, present students with a curriculum that is inclusive and culturally responsive, allowing them to learn more about themselves and others in preparation for success in a globally competitive future. Next slide. As you know, as part of our search for new curricula, at the start of quarter two, based on initial results from a curriculum review in line with the 6002 process, we began a small field test of the HMH into literature curriculum. This involved nine schools at grades 7, 8, 10, and 11. On the screen, you'll see a brief summary of the successes and challenges noted to date in that field test. For example, some successes noted in resources and accessibility are that, quote, passage based assessments have been very useful for gathering formative assessment data and that a variety of suggestions are offered for differentiation from multiple student groups. A few challenges that were noted so far in implementation and engagement are that teachers are finding end of unit assessments very lengthy and are taking a lot of class time and texts in certain grade levels have been noted as unengaging for students. We will continue to collect data in these core areas from these field testing schools throughout the remainder of this school year. Next slide, please. We know um, what we know is that identifying the right curriculum for our students in BCPS requires a significant investment of time and careful exploration. Therefore, what we are proposing is a full scale pilot implementation next year to include the other two vendor products that our 6002 process revealed to be the highest ranking when looked at from both a holistic ELA lens as well as from a very specific lens focused on supporting multilingual learners, which we know is one of our fastest growing student populations. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kraft, who will share a brief overview of each vendor product. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so we're going to really give a very brief overview. As you know, these um, materials have been on public notice, so they are on display um, uh, at the Greenwood uh, building and also um, digital uh, materials can be accessed online. Um, and so Study Sync is a comprehensive ELA program that serves uh, students in grades 6 through 12. It was designed uh, to be aligned to the Common Core State Standards. Um, which are very similar to our Maryland College and Career Ready standards. Um, and so they fully align with our English language arts standards. Um, it really is um, a combination of digital and print materials um, with the idea of uh, it being a combination of direct instruction and small group instruction with high uh, amount of student choice. Um, and part of uh, their um, responsiveness to student engagement is that they are adding 10 new texts to the collection every month and every single day they add uh, something that's called a blast, um, which is a high interest um, topic that can actually um, range from any subject, uh, not just English language arts, but students can respond not only um, to students in their class, but if the teacher enables it to other students um, within the state of Maryland or even bigger, depending on how you want to limit that. Um, so there's this, this real world authentic kind of like tweet like feature to really authentically uh, engage with topics that are um, current um, and relevant to students. Um, additionally, um, a next slide. I want to talk a little bit about how it meets learner variability. And so there are um, robust options within the teaching materials to ensure that uh, learners needs are being met. Everything um, from scaffolding that is aligned to WIDA standards for our multilingual learners. Uh, there's differentiated lesson plans that talk about striving readers, um, that talk about advanced learners who are ready for more. Uh, there are really a, a variety of different options um, for those approaching grade level so that everybody can interact with grade level standards, text and tasks. And so those are built right within the platform for the teacher, whether you're using the digital teacher guide or the print teacher guide, those are there for you to use. They also give um, options for remediation. So if a student isn't able to demonstrate proficiency within a lesson, they tell you exactly where you can find additional resources to help support that student. Um, next slide. Um, Additionally, their professional development um, really has um, several different options. So there are online courses that are embedded right within the platform, which includes the quick start course. They have assessment courses. Um, there's author videos that talk about different pedagogical opportunities uh, and different instructional models. There's classroom video libraries where they've gone into actual classrooms and um, tape teachers using it so that um, teachers can actually see the different parts of the lesson in action with real students. None of them are actors, but actually um, being implemented in a classroom. Uh, they also, one of the things that I like about their professional development options is they have district facilitated workshops, which means that they actually design them to be delivered by the district personnel, um, and they give you a, a facilitator guide, sometimes video clips um, that you can use either within a PLC or a professional, like on our professional development days. Um, and so that allows us to customize in the way that meet our need. They also obviously offer live virtual or in-person uh, initial training sessions as well as coaching in the classroom. Um, and additionally on the screen, you can see a few more options, which are there are free weekly training webinars. I just snipped um, the week that um, I had made the presentation to show you just some of the things that were available that week, but every single week they update their um, offerings. Um, and there, I do love that they have a live, live chat with a specialist from 12 to 4 um, Eastern Standard Time. So somebody that not is just customer service, but is a specialist with the program. Um, and so there are several different options for professional learning. So that's a little bit about Study Sync. Um, next, we're going to, if you'll go to the next slide, um, we're going to talk about Savvis. Um, and so what I wanted to show you is some of the program offers, uh, authors of Savvis. Um, uh, Savvis is also a comprehensive 6 to 12 research based 
a comprehensive literacy program um, that really um, offers a lot of variety in terms of themes, real world scenarios, and they really um, operate on this idea that in the beginning, the teacher is more directive, where they're really trying to move it to a more facilitated approach. And so it's really this gradual release of responsibility um, throughout a unit of instruction. So as students are becoming more proficient, the teacher is backing out and instead is helping facilitate that learning. Um, so every unit uses that approach, which is that gradual release from whole class to small group to independent learning. Um, uh, next slide, please. And so how they meet learner variability, uh, they also have robust uh, options for multilingual learners where they have three different levels identified for um, meeting um, needs of multilingual learners. Um, they also have students that are striving readers um, and they call them below level. They uh, have a section for them and they also have a section specifically for above level uh, readers and learners and how you can extend and enrich instruction for them. Um, and so they provide notes that give targeted scaffolds um, for each of those um, groups of students um, so that everybody's needs can be met throughout the program. And then on the screen were just a few of the different ways that they um, try to meet learner variability, which is through unit opener videos, selection media, digital the digital library, and they also have vocabulary interactive lessons. Uh, next slide. Um, Savas also has um, a robust professional development center with author videos and white papers to offer additional support around topics such as writing, vocabulary, and student engagement. They also have a specialist that can deliver on-site professional learning and will also work with the district on providing options customized to the district needs. And so they will say, well, here's what we do um, on a standard basis, but what would you like it to look like in your district based on your goals? And so they will take um, what they already have developed and they will customize it for what the needs in our district are. Um, you can also see that they have several uh, different options where you can also do asynchronous. So um, as we have teachers or leaders joining us around the, the uh, entire school year, um, they will still get um, professional learning around how to launch the curriculum, ongoing support, um, and uh, also tutorials that include real-time assistance. And so all of that is available for teachers as they are learning the program, implementing, and have questions about any um, of the student groups that maybe need additional help, they can reach out and get professional learning. Next slide, please. All right, so that was a little bit about Savis. Um, and so our last product we're gonna talk about is the one that um, Ms. Wicks talked about a minute ago. Uh, we are we did a very small um, field test this year. Um, and so we're gonna talk about HMH. And so um, they are um, a student-centered program that offers um, the ability to collaborate and communicate to enhance creative and critical thinking skills, as well as nurture, nurturing problem solving skills. Um, and they really, um, they also have units that um, really center around thematic content um, where students have an opportunity to read, write, speak, and listen um, spiraled together to meet uh, the um, standards um, for the grade level. Um, and so there is this consistent spiraling of standards and skills across all of the units. Um, so we do, the program does come back to skills again. So if a student isn't able to master it the first time, they will see that skill again. There is also the ability to um, find if a student didn't um, master something to find additional resources to help them just in time. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so, the, um, can you just click one more time for me? I'm sorry, I know, I, I'm sorry, I had animations, keep going. Okay, so meeting learner variability. I am so sorry about that. I know I'm not supposed to use the animations. Um, so the teacher edition helps teacher um, teachers support not only striving readers, 
as well as multilingual learners, but also students that are beyond grade level um, in academics. And so there are, are a variety of ways uh, that um, HMH meets learner variability. And so you see a few of them on the screen. Um, again, this is not inclusive of every way, but just a smattering of the different supports that they do have. So they have close read screencast and practice pages. They have interactive lessons, um, peer coach videos. So they actually have a student talking through the strategy um, instead of a teacher. So they can actually he uh, hear from a peer their own age. They have level up tutorials that can be assigned. Again, if they aren't aren't getting something in particular, those level up tutorials can be an additional support. Um, there's adapted text, um, and then they have intervention resources um, that align to each of the units. Um, additionally, they have text sketches that are available in English and Spanish, which is another way for students to um, be able to understand the story and have an entry point um, if you do have a, a striving reader or a multilingual learner. Um, next slide. Uh, for again, for professional learning, they have um, multiple. Oh, it disappeared. Um, <laughs> it's okay. I know it. Um, they have multiple different options, um, like the other um, two products that I talked about. So you can get live. Um, training from um, specialists. Um, you also can um, see that they have um, also live events that you can register for on your own that are um, available for you to specifically look at the different resources that you're using in the classroom. Um, there is a teacher success pathway. Um, we would obviously offer the live getting started sessions, but if we had teachers that missed it for whatever reason, um, you can actually watch one right on the platform. So they would not be prevented from starting the program. Um, each guided learning pathway consists of a recommended sequence of live sessions, on-demand interactive media, and videos to help teachers plan, teach, and assess learning using the HMH program. Um, administrators can also see what the teachers have done, and they can actually see what um, different um, program options and PD options that they have participated in. Um, next slide. So, um, oh, Miss Wicks, did you? I'm sorry, Miss Wicks, did you want to jump back in, or you want me to keep going? Either way, I think we didn't plan who was doing what. <laughs> I know, I know. I was like, wait, I've just been talking for a while. I'll do um, you. I'll do a slide, and you do a slide. How's that? Sounds great. <laughs> okay. Um, so a couple of these dates are past, but we just kind of wanted to let you know what has happened so far. So on March 12th, when we had our curriculum night, we had a parent preview. We brought all, all the products with us. Um, um, which was a lot of boxes, um, but we had all the resources for grade six to 12 out on display. We did have parents come by and look, and actually we had a couple that actually analyzed and gave us an analysis of the three products. Um, the next day, we actually brought then all of those materials to the principal leadership development and principals had time to interact with all three programs. Um, on March 12th, we put a copy of all three programs um, of all the student materials in grades 6 to 12 out on public notice in Greenwood Building E. Um, and they are actually, I know it says through April 3rd, but um, we are going to leave them there till the end of the week. So if you haven't had a chance to get by and you still want to, they're out there. Um, on March 20th, we had a DC informational drop-in meeting to talk a little more about the um, pilot for next year. Um, and then Ms. Wicks uh, led our monthly department chair meeting today where we talked a little more about uh, what a pilot would look like and talking about um, implementation integrity. Um, and then of course, well, it was gonna be tomorrow, but you see us today, so that should actually say April 3rd. Uh, we're with you to talk a little bit more. Um, next slide, and Ms. Wicks is gonna tell you about the second half of our timeline. Thank you so much, Dr. Kraft. Um, what we anticipate is that on April 8th, each school will be notified about which of the vendor programs they will be piloting for next year, and then teachers would receive digital access to that program so they can prepare. Um, and then our hope and our goal is April 16th to present to the Board of Education. Um, and then June 24th and June 25th have been designated as system-wide teacher professional learning. And our intention is then to really immerse teachers in the product of their specific school designation so that we can begin in earnest the training and the planning and um, work out any kinks and questions they have going into the summer. 
Then we hope to do the same thing with ad, um, administrators for professional learning. That July date is still to be determined. And then our hope with approval is for district wide implementation beginning fall of 2024. Next slide. And I think that ends us officially, and we are open for any questions. Thank you for your time. Okay, questions from board members? Who wants to go first? Ms. Domanowski? <laughs> okay, uh, I, have a, I have quite a few, so if anybody wants to cut me off and, and just cut me off. <laughs> um, so a couple of things. Um, with HMH, if going back to the slide with the challenges and successes, uh, I think it was the third slide. Okay, well, it just, um, it seems like there were a lot more challenges than successes, and I'm wondering if we have any more feed, like written feedback from teachers that have, were using this, um, any other research, any other data. Maybe it's the next one. I'm not sure which will keep. Um, yeah, this is it. Yeah, thank you. Um, just any other official data um, to to back this, you know, curriculum up or the statistics of success for this curriculum. So, I do want, I'm sorry, Ms. Wicks, you can start. I can go after you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so we do have a variety of data that we collect, have collected thus far. Because we are still in process with the field testing schools, um, that data varies from day to day. So we have done school visits um, for the classrooms where it's being implemented. We've done teacher and student surveys. We have scheduled for teacher and student focus groups that are going forward. And um, in full transparency, the data has been mixed throughout. Um, in each category, there have been sometimes more successes than challenges, depending on the quarter, and then that changes throughout. So we are still in the process of collecting that data and tabulating um, the teacher and student feedback from the nine schools that are currently field testing. Dr. Kraft, did you want to add? Um, so there are a few districts in Maryland using it that have um, uh, um, have said that they are having success with it. And so I can get some more detailed information. Um, these are all, you know, research based curriculum. They've been vetted through Ed Reports or another third party vendor. All three of these have been vetted through Ed Reports. Um, a lot of these additions, one of the things that, you know, I just want to add is, you know, with COVID, there was a, a period of time where no districts really had a lot of meaningful data. Um, and so that's why we want to um, expand to a full year pilot where we can really look at student achievement over time because you really have to allow it to have enough time to really then look at student achievement data because usually the purpose of a pilot is to see about usability and scalability. Um, Ms. Shea, did you want to add in? Yes, I was just going to offer that when we um, first identified HMH um, to field test this year, there were some efficacy studies done in other states. So there was a quasi experimental study for HMH done at the middle school level in Texas that involved, I think it was something like 800 middle schools, and that demonstrated moderate evidence, which is the second highest level of impact. Um, and showed that there was a st statistically significant difference observed between into literature schools and not. Um, and then they also had a published efficacy study. As um, Dr. Kraft said, some of the years, like in the 21 um, school year, they didn't have um, external state data, which as Dr. Kraft mentioned, um, but they did also have um, studies that were done um, efficacy studies outside of Maryland. So mm -hmm. the one that I've referenced um, at middle school was in the south um, southwest region, I believe, in the state of Texas. Um, and then they also had one um, done at the high school level um, that had demonstrates a rationale, which again, when we think about those levels of evidence for ESSA, um, I, that's the one. So the one at the middle school level demonstrated moderate evidence, which is the one right beneath strong. <laughs> and then um, ESSA levels has four levels, the first one being demonstrates a rationale, um, and that was at the high school level. And that was because, as Dr. Kraft said, they did not have the um, state assessment data. So 
what that report study showed was that the curriculum itself demonstrates the rationale, which is that first entry level under ESSA for um, having that positive impact. So those are two outside of Maryland. And then as Dr. Kraft said, we do have some other districts within the state. And then as Ms. Fix described, um, we're still in process of collecting that internal data. And again, as Dr. Kraft said, all three of these programs have met the highest level um, through ed reports of meets expectations. And ed reports, as you know, is one of the, um, I guess, clearing houses that the state of Maryland identifies for um, use in naming high quality instructional materials. Um, are we using anything other than ed reports because they've uh, admitted themselves that they need to do a better job at reviewing educational curriculums, uh, especially when it comes to. Uh, I write it down to basal. They, so they have, one, oh, go ahead, I'm, sorry, sorry, I'm, sorry. Just, I'm just wondering how much weight we're putting into ed reports if we're using any other. Um, so we, MS, oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead. So MSD is also using ed reports as one of their foundational um, components for identifying high quality instructional material. However, they've also done um, a national uh, creation an alignment of a rubric that they're using to evaluate their curriculum, which so part of looking at various curricula to pilot in BCPS is that there is further investigation just even by our own state department of ed to identify, um, uh, to your point, um, another measure aside from ed reports to really, you know, evaluate curricula. But um, HMH was also, as Ms. Shea had shared, um, evaluated through the, the ESSA rubric that was used and received um, ratings through that. We also, I mean, it's a fair question. We also looked at a couple of other, so um, Massachusetts has a great website called Curate. And they, state ones, right? Yeah, and, um, and so there's a couple of state ones, but Curate is one that um, I'd love to point you to um, because they've also re um, reviewed the products and they have a separate review from Ed Reports and they also gave it a high rating. Um, and they use actually, they cite, um, similar to Ed Reports, they cite specific text evidence um, and they tell you, you know, they break it into different parts like text quality, um, found, well, you don't need foundational skills for K-5, but classroom text and instructions, is it accessible for students? Is it usable for teachers? And then if there is impact on student learning. So like you were just asking about, like if there are other white papers out there, then they also link that. Um, and so we did look at um, a couple of those state uh, websites that are pretty robust um, to look at what how they rated um, also. So we aren't leaning on just Ed reports. Um, we really try to look across several different evaluation methods as well as other districts in Maryland um, to get a comprehensive view um, when we look at it all together. And my other question about that would be, did we look at anything that else that has been around more than, you know, four or five years that, you know, before COVID has it just has a, a stronger, um, you know, more a stronger track record of working. I, I just feel like we're looking at some brand new curriculums that have only, you know, we don't have a lot of data on because of COVID. And now we're kind of treating our children like guinea pigs in a way with these pilots to see how it works. And I just, I don't think, I, I don't, I'm not sure about that. Especially so, when you look at HMH had the the 90 rating when you brought it before us, and the the other two had the 81 rating of approval from, um, and that's why you chose HMH to pilot first. So, and uh, just what are your thoughts on that? Is there anything? Do we have anything else that's been around a little bit longer that we could look at? So, as part of the 6002 process we um, can only evaluate the products that are submitted. Um, and so there are times where there might be other products we wanna look at. So I you know, just recently had an RFI out for foundational skills. Um, and the reality is the, the products, mm -hmm. the way that our 6002 is that they have to respond to the bid and then we evaluate them. Now, 
interestingly enough, uh, when we finished reviewing all of the products, um, the scores were had a much less differential um, because we weren't quite finished when we first brought it to you all. We were waiting. There were there were about six people that hadn't finished, and we weren't sure if they were or not. Um, we also subsequently did a review, um, a review that specifically looked at multilingual learners. When we think about um, Dr. Rogers' priority areas um, and knowing that we are um, moving away from ESOL hubs and students are returning to their home schools, we also have to make sure we have a curriculum that's going to support them. So we actually did another review of the top three before products um, to say, which of these also really intentionally supports multilingual learners. Um, and that's how we got to the three um, is when we went back and looked and aligned the first round results and then specifically looking at multilingual learners and the supports that they have, um, that all three are now very close in score. Um, and what's really interesting, the, those are pr predominantly the three that are being used across Maryland also. So when you look at all of the different districts for middle and high, um, those really are the ones that are coming up the most frequently. If I can just add one other quick thing. Um, it is pretty typical in publishing, Ms. Dominowski, for publishers to renew or update the version. Usually it's around every six years. So, for example, StudySync, I believe the first one um, was in like 2014. So while we're bringing forward a version that may have only been published because we're trying to give the most current information, the version that we would be proposing to pilot, and I'm just using StudySync as one example, is from 2020 or 2021 or sometimes 2022. Many of these actually have been around for longer than that. It's just that it's a pretty typical cycle for publishing um, to update their materials or to make revisions and changes. Um, so it isn't that it came whole cloth out of nowhere um, in that year, but it is the version that um, we would be bringing forward for pilot. So I just wanted to add that piece as well. Um, and Ms. we Craft, can certainly what was check the, name? the original published dates for the others. Sorry, Ms. Lecter. No, what was the name, um, Dr. Kraft, of the other, when Ms. Dominowski talked about Ed Reports, oh, you first mentioned yeah, another, would, yeah, what was it called? Your, it's called Curate, and it's through uh, the Department of Education in Massachusetts. It's C-U-R-A-T-E. Um, okay. And if you just put Curate in DOE Massachusetts, it'll come up um, for ELA. Um, and their reports are quite robust. And I think that that's another really good site to look at and read more about it. And we should do our due diligence. I, I, I don't disagree with any of that. And so I've read all of the reports um, on all the products that we, we've brought forward today um, to, you know, really understand, you know, we want to make sure that we're putting the highest quality material in front of our students. We don't have time to waste. We want to make sure. We also know that we typically enter into a five-year contract. So we also want to be very thoughtful and intentional as we are making this decision. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Dominowski, yeah. do you have other questions or do you want me to come back around? Um, uh, you can come back around. Okay. Ms. Booker I'll, Dwyer? I'll yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll come back around. Ms. Booker Dwyer? <laughs> oh, I think Ms. Dolesky had her hand before me. Oh, I'm just, I'm sorry. I was looking at the, the numbers. Yeah. I'll go after Mr. Ms. Teleski. <laughs> okay, Ms. Teleski, I don't. Okay, now I see Thank it. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I do have a lot of questions, um, but I just want to start. I really like this graphic with the HMH with the successes and challenges. It makes it really clear in terms of what teachers, administrators, and then also students would work with or, or would have to um, deal with in terms of challenges, and then just. With this graphic, I mean, a number of challenges just scream out at me. You know, lack of of non um, computer copies. Teachers need more resources. The prompts are vague. The the learning needs of of GT learners would not be met. Lengthy assessments. Pacing is a challenge. Some of the texts are not engaging. Time consuming for students to access HMH. Activities are repetitive and therefore engagement is an issue. And I do think it would be really helpful for um, the other two contracts to have a graphic like this to just really be able to compare. Um, I don't know if we can spend some time 
talking about some of the successes and, and, and most importantly, the challenges, um, just because it seems for all three, but HMH, this is helpful. For the other two, I feel like we're getting just sort of an overview and it's really hard for us to assess how um, if I can clarify, so we, we have oh, not yeah. field tested the other two. We've only field tested HMH. The other two would be new. We don't have data because we haven't started okay. the other two. That's what we're proposing, that it would be all three that we'd be moving forward with. OK, and then would there be any information on successes and challenges from other school systems that have piloted or I used? Yeah, a great question. I actually reached out to um, two of the counties um, before spring break, um, and I haven't heard back from each, either of them, um, but I'm going to reach out again um, because that is one of the things that we typically do is we ask um, and um, we're actually going to look at, um, a, we have a literacy lab coming up from the state um, and we're going to one of the school systems that's using study sync. So we're going to see that in person. So we are trying to do our due diligence and talk to people um, about, you know, their implementation successes and challenges, because I think we can always learn from them, you know, about what's working. Um, so at this point, I didn't hear back from either. I was hoping, I was like, please, please write me back before um, Craig and Committee but it just didn't happen but just know it's out there and as that information comes in we are happy to compile it and send it to you all and then i'll just ask one other quick question and then i'll pass it on i mean i guess i just feel a little bit uneasy just because it does seem you know we're kind of walking into an, a world unknown that you know so just wanted to kind of communicate that and then my other question is um what is the cost for the one-year pilot for each of the programs? We have not negotiated all the details yet. Um, as you know, we have 11 million set aside for the adoption for the five-year contract. So we would not go over any amount that would um, not allow us to extend for those additional four years. Um, but we are going to um, be as frugal as possible while still giving teachers the PD and the materials that they need. Um, so I don't have the, the bottom line of all the numbers at this point. Um, Ms. Shea, did you want to add anything in on that? Yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the bottom line is I just, I don't have, because until we have approval, you, you know, then I, then I can work on, you know, numbers and cost and, and, and all those things. Okay. Like we don't have any kind of estimate or like any any estimate on cost or is it really just sort of like a wait and see? Well, no. no. Oh, go, ahead. go ahead. Um. So, Ms. Selesky, what we were doing also was we talked with DRAA to um, help identify which schools will participate in each of the pilots. So we ensure school size, demographic, feeder patterns from middle to high across schools. So we're still finalizing the exact numbers of which schools would be within each um, pilot group. So that, of course, is a variable when looking um, and meeting with a vendor. And what we really wanted to do was speak with you guys about the idea of really trying to move forward with a more thorough examination of the curricula to really evaluate what is in the best interest for a long-term commitment for our students. So while we have funds for a one-time purchase of a curriculum and we could just put forth, you know, a let's go with HMH, what we really want to do is further explore these other two curricula that really, um, especially when we started looking at how does it meet uh, the diverse learning needs of our student population, to have a more thorough and robust examination that really provides us with additional student achievement data to compare and look at um, that really allows teachers to get much more comfortable in a longer period of time um, and on road for them to learn the information and to learn the materials as well as a longer implementation time. Um, so the idea is truly to not to spend one year's worth across the three to be able to do a pilot so that there's our funds remaining to then extend the four year contract for the one that is actually identified. Okay. Thank you. Okay, 
We'll come back to you, Ms. Teleski, if you have some more. Um, Ms. Booker Dwyer. Hi, so thank you. Uh, this is this is a, a very informative presentation. And I just want to take a step back and level set. So what is the purpose of this presentation? Are you so look OK, go ahead. So the purpose was to really share with the curriculum committee that change in intentionality of curriculum selection and piloting within BCPS that we are really trying to thoroughly examine through a year long pilot across all grade levels within the schools um, to really evaluate what will be the best um, materials for our students and provides supports and resources and tools for teachers that provides time and uh, space for us to provide professional development and at the same time there would be contracts coming forward for each of these so this is the the preview of so that it's not just here's a contract for something without truly understanding the intentionality of this shift in piloting to have a more thorough in-depth understanding of curricula and also our goal of being fiscally responsible and aligning with MSD's process of identifying high quality instructional materials. The last thing we would want to do is identify a program or tools or resources that then don't aren't identified by MSD and we've entered into a five year contract. So in order for us to fully evaluate the curriculum with our students, as well as ensure alignment with MSD, this is the pathway that we would like to take. OK, so this is OK, so that's that's helpful. So today you're not looking for us to vote to move forward or anything like that this is just for information letting us know what the revised approach is to reviewing curriculum yes and that a contract contracts will be moving forward but again getting your input from this as far as no this is a terrible idea to do a year-long pilot we like the, you know just doing a part of a school year pilot we want to just do small field tests i mean our goal is to be able to put high quality instructional materials in front of our students next year while different programs have different types of materials it all goes back to really working with our teachers to understand content standards and then understand the pedagogical approaches that support student learning for our secondary students and so while again a story might be different between one school and another school for what sixth graders are reading. The focus of professional learning is also embedding and helping teachers understand the standards, how standards live within stories that students are reading, how stu how pedagogical approaches, whether it's more directed, whether it's more collaborative, whether it's more exploratory, how those different approaches um, work with students to help support their learning. So the you know the different texts that may be used because of the different field tests and different vendors um, you know will be something for teachers to learn but the professional development is truly layering in the pedagogy and practices um, that we want to support teachers with okay so my question is then i would like to see like what are the evaluation tools that you are using to assess the effectiveness of the implemented curriculum and so even before we start looking at the um, curriculum that we're that, you know, being considered, what is the process that, you know, what is what are the tools that are being used? And um, and, you know, with the lessons learned from the HMH field test, so when we look at these challenges, um, I would even want to see another column with how you're overcoming those challenges, how, because there's always challenges. When I look at these challenges, these are typical of a new curriculum rollout. Um, so there's nothing on here that's like, oh, no, we need to abandon, you know, abandon ship. And I know with HMH, it's, you know, it's beyond ed reports. There are several, um, you know, you have What Works Clearinghouse, you have, uh, there's all kind of uh, research that has been done on this curriculum. And I'm not saying just because they say it's great out there, I'm not saying, okay, this is the best for Baltimore County because we're still field testing. Um, but it would be helpful to see, you know, we have these challenges. This is how we're overcoming challenges. And then to you know proactively address challenges in the in the future, we're going to use this evalu evaluation tool as a part of our assessing the curriculum as it's being rolled out. And then the other piece that I have, because we have invested so much money into HMH, 
um, for our early grades. I'm wondering how does, you know, the curriculum that you're looking at now, how does it complement the continuum of instruction that students are getting so that it doesn't, it won't be like this jarring uh, stop all of a sudden. So if you're used to, to learning and engaging with the curriculum in one way, and then I know with every curriculum, there's nuances um, with how instruction is delivered and that can impact how students are um, receiving the content, how they, you know, now they it's shifting like, okay, wait, I was doing this and now I got to shift to do that. And there could be a bit of a learning curve. So I would like to see, you know, just understanding that, that continuum of uh, how, how does the things that we are proposing, how does it complement the, that continuum from K to 12 so that it's just kind of this seamless through line for students um, in what they're experiencing with the curriculum and they're just growing on it growing with it. And it's not just this, you know, stop, you know, we we're done with HMH. Now we're going to this next one and there's this big shift. So, um, so I would love to know more information about that as well. And then the last piece that, um, that I would like more information about is just, you know, I, I know that it was presented to parents and there's displays in the, the lot in lobbies and all of that, but how are we collecting that feedback from parents and what are they saying and what are the students saying? So all of that would be helpful to inform the final decisions. Um, but I'm not opposed to the pilot doing the year long. I think that is the right way to go, but I just, I, I never just want us to see putting challenges out there without showing that Baltimore County Public Schools, we have a, a way that we're overcoming these challenges. We're not just going to leave the challenges hanging out there. OK, <clears throat> so that was a lot. I'm going to try if I miss a piece, will you come back to it? Because they were all great questions. Um, so we are working with DRAA on our research collection. It's going to be a mix of quantitative and qualitative feedback, um, but I can give you the buckets. Um, so we're going to look at student engagement, teacher usability, um, classroom implementation, which will be actual walkthroughs that we look in and see how it's being implemented. Um, technology integration. And then as you men, one of you mentioned on the screen, you're like, we see there's some technology issues. So we will look at that technology piece. And then we also, because it will be a full year pilot, we will look at student results. And so we will look for an external data source that can tell us how students are growing. Um, and so we haven't flushed it all out, but we are working with DRAA to um, have a robust evaluation method that will be in place before the pilot, the pilot even begins in the fall. Um, in terms of con um, continuation, so one of the things I can say, and that was my first thought when we actually started the, the field test with HMH is, you know, I had this idea. Um, in fact, it's one of the reasons I moved to BCPS because my position was K to 12. Like that was, was intriguing enough for me to leave a county that I'd been in my almost my entire career. Um, I think it is really important that alignment between elementary and middle and the middle and high, huge. Um, what I will tell you is the structures are different in the HMH 6 to 12, so it's not as prolific as I thought it would be once we started implementation. Now, that's not to say that some of the things aren't the same, um, but it's not the, it's whether we go with HMH or Savis or um, McGraw Hill, um, they will all of them will have a transition. What is nice is the through line is the standards. And so when teachers really fully understand and implement standards based instruction, that's really where we can lean in on the transition and the alignment. Um, some of those other things that I thought maybe would be really, really cool when we went from having it K-5 HMH to middle school um, wasn't, as, like I said, as prolific as I thought it would be. Um, however, whatever product is selected, we will make sure and we really are looking at those transition grades. And currently, because we haven't adopted in middle or high, we actually created a transition um, unit for our sixth grade and our ninth grade students, recognizing the need to make sure that we are making sure they understand the language and how it connected to whether they were in elementary or middle previously, how that happens. And so what I wanted to assure you is whatever product we go with, we're going to make sure that those alignments do exist for our students because we know that is so important. Um, did I miss a piece? 
No, you, you covered it. Okay. Um, okay, I, thank I you. Did, I did just want to add, um, I appreciate Ms. Booker Dwyer, the piece that you said about the challenges that that is going to happen with any new rollout of a curricula. Um, and, and to address your question about how are we addressing the challenges, um, I just want to spend just a moment on that piece. So A, um, as you shared, that really is the point of the field test, right? And so what you all are seeing is really just feedback from nine of our 50 plus secondary schools, right? This field test was a very small population where we started and our goal was to see, okay, what are the kinks and the challenges that are coming up? And so the internal work of our office has been to identify, okay, which of these challenges are a result of um, a different method of professional development that we need to make sure we're providing for teachers next year, which of these are a result of things we need to ask the vendor for as we move forward with a fuller implementation. The other thing I do want to surface also is, you know, some of the lessons that we've learned from this very small field test are really around how is it being introduced. So again, this was a very small selection of schools that started second quarter. So there were some schools and some teachers that had some um, immediate reluctance because they were really set in doing what they wanted to do or what they had already thought they were going to do for the year. And finally, what we know that does color all of our feedback is that we a lot of the professional development we're going to need to do is really around a culture shift of moving from a homegrown BCPS teacher written curriculum to um, a purchased curriculum that is evidence based and does qualify as highly you know um, highly qualified instructional materials because some of what we're, we did learn from the field test is okay that resistance of moving from one reality to a different reality is something we're going to have to really confront head on so that our feedback is not necessarily colored by some of those personal feelings so i just wanted to share that part and thank you for um, acknowledging that thank you for that thank you um, Ms. Pumphrey. I think most of my questions were addressed. Um, I did want to piggyback a little bit, bit on uh, one of Ms. Booker Dwyer's questions that I think was not addressed, which was about the parent feedback and how we are obtaining that and using that feedback. Um, but relative to that, my question was about the public notice and display. Um, I appreciate that you mentioned that the curricula was brought to the um, curriculum meeting, the public curriculum meeting, um, and that you did get some parent feedback from that meeting. Um, is this also presented online for parent review? I'm specifically yeah. speaking to um, the because, and the reason I'm asking is because if you go on to the BCPS website, and I think I brought this up in the past for another um, curriculum issue as well. If you look under the material review section, which is very convenient to click on, but this is not there. And so that's a concern that I have, that that's not seen on that very um, easy to find link or uh, button to click on the uh, home page for BCPS. Um, well, that's something we certainly can follow up on um, because we, we like I said, we, we're going to extend. Um, we're still collecting feedback. We, so to answer your question, thank you. I knew there was one piece I forgot. Um, I was trying to read my scribbled notes. Um, so thank you for circling back. Uh, so we actually did a survey. Um, and so we haven't compiled because it's still open because public review is still going on um, where we just ask them very like, what is it that you want from a um, curriculum product um, for your student? Um, what would be what would what does your child need to thrive? Um, what you know um what did you see um that was engaging within the text so we asked them and then there was a, a place for just some general comments um and so we're collecting that survey we'll do a very similar um kind of compilation to what you see on the screen right now um that tells us a little bit and so they had to, the very first thing they could do they could review all of them that they wanted they could pick one um but we will then have it specific by product um to get the feedback from the community and it can be parents or anybody in the community um that wants to give feedback um on it so they you know they can you know um select um to review the products and so we are gonna that will be a part of you know what we look at um and as you know we have one more curriculum night coming up and we will bring those products again with us that night so we are trying to be as visible as possible um and also you know obviously having it in the same meeting uh, um building as a board meeting um we're hoping that anybody that comes can just access those materials and sit in the atrium um, and look at the materials. And so I will follow up um, why the link is not accessible. Um, I will do that 
um, today. Yeah, so I just wanted to speak to that as well, because it was our intention and in the exact link that you described, Ms. Pumphrey, and I just clicked myself, and you're right, it's going back to the elementary science one, which is actually somewhat outdated now. So we can follow up on that, yeah. and then, as Dr. Kraft said, we can extend it to make sure that, right. because that was the intent, was to have it right at that easy access right from the home page. Um, to connect that. So I'm not sure why it's still linking to the old one, but we can certainly follow up and make sure that it does. And I know that's been something that staff has been working on. I asked that question before about another part of curriculum. So I don't know if there's a disconnect or someone else I should be asking to make sure that it's put there. Um, yeah, I, 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 I definitely think we need to follow up and find that out yeah. because it, to your point, that's not the web page we own directly. So we always have to go through someone else to change that. So you're right. Clearly there's a breakdown somewhere because I know Dr. Kraft, myself, and actually sneak preview, Ms. Blotner for <laughs> ELD had an email thread several weeks ago to do yeah. exactly that. So we can certainly follow up on that. And in, and in full disclosure, my question about that previously uh, it came from the community, you know, as, as yeah. you know, which is good. I want to, <laughs> so I want to make sure that those questions are addressed. Absolutely. And, and I'm glad that there's people that. looking and asking yeah. for it. That's the point. That actually so, makes us very happy. Yeah, that's a good thing. So we can follow up on that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump in before we go to round two, it looks like. But um, so mm -hmm. mine's, uh, mine's more of a comment. Um, I appreciate the more thoroughness of a year long pilot versus the, the small field tests that we have. I mean, there is a sense of urgency. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, worried about another year um, before we you know, decide on something, but I do think we need to be more thorough. I'm also concerned about um, if we have three pilots, two thirds of these teachers will have to switch again the following year. So how do we, I mean, that's just a, the reality. I mean, if you do two, then only half the teachers will have to make a switch and learn something new. But with three of the pilots, then we will have, you know, two thirds of our teachers getting something new the following year. Well, I understand the standards and all those pieces would be that through line. It's still gonna be new materials and new structures and new systems in place. So I'm not, you don't have to answer anything. I'm just, is there, you know, as you proceed, I think any way that that can be factored in and I don't know, compensated for, cause that's gonna be huge, especially since they're used to more of a homemade or a, you know, a local put together curriculum versus a um, commercial one, and then they'll be doing two commercial ones in two years. Um, Dr. So Madonna, do you want to? Yeah. So to, to your question, um, that that is something that we have also discussed. Um, and so there is part of our discussion is looking at do we continue the field test schools with HMH and just the field test schools and split the rest of the district between the other two? To your point, then the field test schools that have been doing HMH almost have like a year and a half with HMH, so they would not have a secondary switch because to your point, what we don't want to do is if we switch someone and then that's already not been identified, then they have a conceivable possibility of having three different curricula over over three years if yes. they had participated in the field test. So that's certainly not what we want to do. Um, so we have had some discussion about remaining, uh, keeping just the field test schools with HMH and then splitting the, the rest of the district. So we're still exploring the different options um, in order to make sure we have a cohesive enough data set to also really look at the products. Okay, and then my other question is, why are we um, taking the materials down? If we're, what's the purpose of removing the materials for public display, you know, at the end of this week or next week? Why are they not just continuing to stay available for people as we still work through this? So they can, and if we decide to move forward with a, a three pilot, I think they should stay up because then we're going to be releasing the list of schools. Um, so there's absolutely no reason un unless, you know, there has, I, I don't know if there's a rule, like, actually I'm like, that's great. And then uh, Ms. Shea and Dr. Ditano might be like, no, we can't do that. But in general, I think there's no problem with that. And we would prefer people to have uh, access to it. So um, as long as, you know, <laughs> As long as that's fine with um, uh, Dr. Dino and Mache, I would say just keep it up. Um, I, yeah, I think, I think, that, I think that's, it's something we need to talk with purchasing in their lobby right. about. So yeah, the window um, is just so, the time determined by yeah. procurement. I don't think there's a reason, given the situation, that we can't keep it up. We just have been following the procedures yeah. as yeah. they've so we can, established. We can yeah. follow up on that, but I don't think that's a problem. And once the schools are, you know, split up, like I would want that then the 
the the parents of you know the schools to say like oh I now I really want to go and look at that product so um, that's something we can absolutely follow up on today. Okay, thank you. And back um so Dr. Dinanada, the timeline as far as so the next step is what does the curric not today but does the curriculum committee agree with the format of the year long pilot? Is that to Miss Booker Dwyer's purpose question before? When does that need to, when are you looking for an answer or a decision on that? Um, I don't believe we need approval for that. It was okay. more of really the discussion okay. to help really inform more of the contract part of it. Because, okay. you know, again, we're really trying to shift some practices as far as really providing information and that, and, and I've heard some of the comments that information is provided at curriculum committee, then a week later is a contract and it's not enough time to really know things. So we are bringing this now. So there's a long time to think, you know, to further dig into it, to have a chance for yourselves to explore um, the curriculum if you haven't. So we're, we're really trying to be cognizant of um, feedback that we've heard um, both, you know, either to in curriculum committee or during board meetings as far as having sufficient time to really look at things to not feel pressured. So this is really, you know, and having a very holistic, thorough evaluation of curriculum before we make a long term commitment and purchase. Um, for something. OK, because um, I think like um, there's a couple ideas that have been brought up through questions that may be another presentation, like the evaluation um, mm -hmm. piece. So, yeah. I, OK, um, all right. So here's the other problem It is five. Not problem. It's 512. We have one more um, presentation, the ESAW curriculum assessment. Um, so do, but there's more hands up. So Dr. Donato, do you want us to keep focusing on this one and bring the next one? Because we will stop at 530. Or do you want us to stop this discussion and bring it back again? Um, I don't think 15 minutes would be sufficient time to go through our, our ELD curriculum. Right. So. Um, what I would like to suggest, though, is that we then, to the point of again, then not coming next time with then also a contract proposal with the ELD curriculum, is that we would look to add a meeting. Okay, add an April meeting. To, to okay. be able to be able to provide time to for everyone to thoroughly be able to hear about that. Okay. Pilot also. All right. So I'll look through. I'll look for some dates with um, Miss Gover that doesn't overlap other meetings, and see if we can get another April meeting in. So, hearing that, we'll continue with the questions about this presentation until time runs out at five thirty. Is that okay with everyone? Just shake your heads or do something so I know. Okay. I see. Okay. All right. So. Um, Ms. Daleski's got number one hand up, so um, I'll let you ask the next question. My question was answered. Thank you. OK, Ms. Dominowski. Um, my other question about the visibility, what how would someone know to even look at the website or come to Greenwood to view um, the books or the curriculums uh, that are under review? So by your question, I'm going to guess that communication was not received. We have been working very diligently to ensure that more communication is going out about these types of things. So I'm going to infer from your question that maybe you did not receive a blast information about this, and we will make sure that that happens, which is why, well, again, having sufficient time is great. I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm just no, no, um, no. Is, is I, that the is that the procedure that a, a email goes out that these um, books or these this is under review or this is coming, you know, this is available from this time to this time. This is the dates. This is where you can find it. Here's the link. Like, so part I mean, of the pri yep, based on prior feedback from curriculum committee as far as the visibility and uh, availability and knowledge to your point that curriculum is. Um, available to review because it either will be piloted or considered for purchase. Mm -hmm. um, and so we will follow up with the communications office on that. OK, thank you. And then my other You're thing, um, just to go along with um, Ms. Lister about having you know three pilots going at the same time for a full year. Um, 
could we and and to get more data before we go into that just show us you know not not just the ed reports but the the curator whatever and, and other schools that have already done this what are, what are their you know challenges what are their success rates like it, it i just want to like feel like we're not guinea pigs when we're doing a full year that you know two-thirds of them are not going to be doing that you know the next year and are we wasting our time when we if this isn't really going to work um even though it's you know approved by msd or whatever it's just we only are going to pick one so do are we is it really is this something that we like are three really that good that we can't choose between one of them without going into a full year or is there one that we can say, hey, this isn't for us? Um, if we can look at that, if we can get more data on all three of them, just you know, the success rates that have already you know happened, has it showed improvement in other school districts um, you know, for reading literacy? And um, I also wanted to ask a question about um, teaching graphic text, and if that was part of this curriculum, um, is there are they teaching? It kind of goes along with uh, when they were that the uh, you know looking at the picture to infer what the word is is that part of this curriculum are they going to be teaching is there a graphic novel section of this curriculum where you know they're teaching look at the picture pay close attention to the graphics and to infer what is you know in the text are you able to ask that question of them or is there any so may i ask some clarifying questions because okay. when you first asked your question, so the college and career ready standards do require, standard seven in reading literature does require students to um, interpret uh, multiple sources of information, including information presented graphically. So that is a standard that we teach. So I would expect that any curriculum we adopted expects kids to synthesize information both in print, in graphics such as maps, visuals, charts. That's actually a standard that we teach, and so that would be an aspect. It also sounded like you were talking a little bit about um, pushback that is not aligned to the science of reading in foundational skills curriculum where students are guessing at a word based on the picture. So because this is a secondary curriculum, we don't even address foundational skills at all. So if that's the concern about like the guess and check method of decoding, I can assure you that a six to 12 curriculum does not address that. But when you said about graphics, we do teach that and we would need a curriculum to expect students to be able to synthesize information represented graphically. But those are two different things. So I just want to make sure I understand the question. I think it was it was more of, um, you know, rely if, if you can't understand a passage of the graphic novel to rely on the pictures and the graphics to try to figure out what and it's, it is kind of the same thing as the foundational. But are we? you know, teach the word, like try to get the kids to read what's the words in the graphics before they go to the picture to try to sit. You know, yeah, so in, in makes, secondary yeah. um, information, informational text is where we mostly see it. The information represented graphically is not duplicative of the word. So it's not a fail safe that if you can't understand the words, you look at the picture. It's actually asking kids to synthesize. So it might be an article about food insecurity and there's a graphic that shows um, the percentage of um, stores accessible in the Midwest and kids actually have to use both as sources of information. So it's not a substitute for teaching kids to read and understand information, but it is a skill that we expect students to develop in informational literacy. Okay. And all three publishers do have graphic text um, for students to interpret along with other texts, so that, that is included as part of one of the standards. But it's not instead of teaching them to no. read the words. No, 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 not at all, no. Yeah. Good. And then if if we could before we are we able to I mean, I mean also, I guess it also is it ultimately your decision whether you're going to pilot all three of them or not do we have any say in that at all <laughs> um I guess in the sense of de not if a contract doesn't contract. move forward for one of them or for two of them or none of them. So that would be a deciding factor. But I mean, just like, just a pilot, like like you did a field test for HMH, you said that like, you don't necessarily need us 
to approve a pilot for next year. Like you could go ahead and say, hey, this is what we're going to do, whether you like it or not. And then we have to choose one of the three. Is that? But we have to pay sense? for the pilot. So if we have to pay right, for right. the pilot, then we have to approve a contract. So, so we'd have to, we, we do have to approve whether or not you can do three pilots next year. Essentially, yes. Because of the yes, yeah. yeah, because of the contracts, yes. But if the if if we did you know three tiny little field tests and they were you know nominal amounts that didn't require going through contract committee, but that is not this, and that wouldn't be very transparent. So in all transparency, no. we're bringing everything forward to try to give a full breadth of everything that we're considering. Um, and again, also really providing us with the best option and opportunity to be poised to be ready to implement and, and align with things that MSD might identify as high quality instructional materials that they could then provide guidance on. Um, so we are really trying to ensure that we are being as thorough as possible, also being cognizant and weighing and balancing out um, the implications for schools of you know, implementing more than one thing over a course of time um, and really trying to make the best decisions with regards to that. I understand. I'm just also trying to think about, um, you know, are we, for the sake of ensuring that we're following MSDE and what they need, are we putting, you know, disadvantaging our kids and our teachers for having to go through this process and then just to have to relearn something else again? Like when you talk about professional right. development and the time that our, our teachers have to put in to learn this, I don't want, and the time that the kids, the, the students are going to learn one way and then have to switch and learn a different way. So I just hope that we're looking at, we're weighing both options and not, we're weighing all, mm -hmm. like everyone that is involved, mm -hmm. everyone that will be affected by it and not just what MSDE says we have to do. So I, I think at the foundation of all of it is that our current curriculum is not identified. It hasn't been evaluated for high quality instructional materials and at the base of helping student achievement move forward the first step is to have high quality instructional materials in front of students and so this is a first step no matter what product is used um, of these products because they all check boxes with regards to high quality instructional materials now that is just step one that does not take that doesn't take the most important people out of it, which is the teacher's implementation of that, the professional learning that they're provided in order to do that, the training and support we provide to our school administrators so that they can support their teachers, and that cyclical follow-up uh, with staff um, in that training, monitoring, assessment, feedback um, loop that we need to provide with them. So this is a foundational piece, which is having high quality materials to use with students. Maggie, are you still thinking or are you? <laughs> Go ahead. I, I mean, I don't think that really answered my question, but that, I don't know how else to, to say it. Um, so I just, I'm, okay, I'm hoping that sorry. there will be, I just, I would like to see more data behind these three curriculums and what we've been presented with tonight. See actual numbers, places that this has been used um, before we, you know, test dummy our kids on it. That's all. Sure, absolutely. And to um, Ms. Dominowski's, Point. I think as we as you present more data to us, we have to be really clear about what is data from the field test, which is a first year of implementation, which has all of the complexities of it versus data that you show us that's from teachers who have used it over multiple years where the implementation is much stronger because anybody who implements anything the first year is going to struggle and is, there's going to be challenges and it's not going to be the same type of implementation that happens in year three three or year four. So um, when we're requesting more data, I think we just have to really distinguish what's coming from long term or more than just a field test or a pilot, um, because our data is going to be skewed by that. What we get in a field test or even in the beginning of the pilot is going to be as teachers are learning it. So I think that's important for us to to have um, that understanding when you present it to us. Okay, it is 525 and we got to three items today. No, <laughs> we got to four. We had three quick ones, which was good. And we got, um, but we can't cut this short. So I will um, send out something once I check with um, Ms. Gover tomorrow about dates that may work um, to come back around to do um, 
the ESOL and Dr. Donato, we can meet and try to figure out how to put all this, this together. Um, I was also going to talk, um, the board members have been, um, are putting, are looking at the committees that we have as far as purposes and metrics. I was going to do that, but since we're going to add another meeting, I'm going to wait and add that to our another meeting and, and that will work. Um, if we have more questions, because I'm not sure we got all the questions, do you want board members or committee members to send them to you, Dr. DiDonato, or do you want me to collect them if there's further questions about this topic? I just have two quick questions. Okay, go you ahead. Answer right now. Um, the the first question is just around, um, you know, if we could start proactively thinking about how we are intentionally incorporating um, artificial intelligence students to allow them to explore Chat GTP, Gemini, all these different tools that they can use to help to enhance their writing in a productive way um, throughout the English language arts curriculum. Um, if we could start proactively thinking about that and before we do a five year contract, because I can imagine five years from now that is really going to explode, especially for English language arts. So as we're thinking about new curriculum to start proactively thinking about that, um, that that is my one big question, just kind of forward thinking. And then the second piece is I know the board members were requesting um, additional data from uh, the curriculum from um, the team. Um, if we could be specific with what data we want and how we're going to use it to inform decisions so that it's not just us saying just sh sh share us data, share data with us. Like, how is that? What data are we specifically asking for? Then, how is that going to inform a decision to whether or not we move forward or not with the curriculum? So, if if the maybe the curriculum committee, we could take some time and really map out some key data points we want to see and justify it with the why, so that um, it's really targeted and clear for the uh, the curriculum team. Thank you for that. So, if um, board uh, curriculum members could think committee members could think about those key data points. We'll add that as an agenda item at this next added meeting. Um, so just start thinking about it so that we can be more specific and discuss it as a group next time. Miss Lichter, if you're going to collect or I don't know if you're going to collect ahead of time those that information so that we can try to have that information. If we know specifically, I you know heard some some things that I, I think I have an idea about some things. Um, but did you want to then collect the rest of the questions and then send them to me or what, what is the um, best way? I don't okay. know. Ms. Booker process, Dwyer, were you official. thinking as a, we should come together to decide what data we want or individually just send it? I wasn't sure which approach you were thinking about. I think we should all be clear on what data we want. Um, so that as a, as a body, we're all on the same page with in order for us to make a decision about a curriculum, we need to know X, Y, and Z. OK. Ms. Tolesky, you have still have your hand up? Yeah, just um, I think that's a great idea. Should we email the the data points to you or? Why don't you um, email them to both Ms. Um, Dr. DiDonato and, my, and copy me on it okay. as well? OK, thank you. You're welcome. OK. So. Um, skip, I got to look at my script and skip ahead. Um, the last item on the agenda is announcements, which are not true. It says the next curriculum committee will be held on May 2nd. The next scheduled curriculum meeting is on May 2nd, and we'll work to get a meeting in between now and May 2nd to continue the items that we postponed from today. Is there any further business? Um, I'd like to, again, thank CNI team that presented today. Um, that tried to respond to all of our questions. And also like to thank the people who were supposed to respond today. I mean, we're supposed to present today and we're prepared and who we have um, moved on to the next um, agenda. So um, I appreciate your flexibility with that. Hearing no other business, the meeting is now adjourned and thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.